Good morning, everyone. This is um, Mark Erkin, and I want to welcome everybody to um, this morning's Journal Club. I'm really uh, thrilled that uh, we have two experts in the field of pediatric thyroidology, um, and uh, they both represent two of the preeminent institutions in pediatrics in this country and certainly internationally. Um, our presenter this morning is uh, Dr. Ari Wasser, who is director of the Thyroid Center at Boston Children's Hospital, and he is an assistant professor of pediatrics at Harvard Medical School. He is, um, Dr. Wasser specializes in pediatric thyroid disease with a particular focus on congenital hypothyroidism um, and on thyroid neoplasia in children. He's a member of the ATA Pediatric Thyroid Cancer Guidelines Task Force, and he's also director of the Endocrinology Fellowship Training Program at Boston Children's Hospital. Our discussant this morning is Dr. Andrew Bauer, who is professor of pediatrics at Perlman School of Medicine at the University of Pennsylvania. He, uh, too, is director of the Thyroid Center at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. Um, Dr. Bauer served in the U.S. Army for 29 years, which included two combat tours in Iraq. I um, want to thank you for your service to this country. He's currently the chair of the um, same committee that um, Dr. Wasser is on um, for Pediatric Thyroid Nodule and Thyroid Guidelines Committee of the ATA. Um, he is widely published in the field of pediatric thyroidology. I don't think we could ask for two um, and um, more elite experts in the field of pediatric thyroid disease than uh, these two individuals. Um, and so with that, I'm gonna turn over the program and thank both of them for carving out the time to be a part of this. All right. Thanks, thank Eric. you. Yeah, no problem. Thank you, Dr. Erkin, and, and thank you for the invitation. I, I understand this is the first pediatric topic of this uh, this series, so I just wanna thank uh, you, Dr. Erkin, and thank for, for uh, including a pediatric topic and hopefully we'll we'll get to see more of this uh, coming coming up. So um, this is the the article that I was asked to talk about today about differences in thyroid nodule cytology and malignancy risk between children and adults. Um, before I get started, um, I was asked to, to read this case presentation as a poll for the group. So this case is a seven-year-old boy who presents with a palpable mass in the neck and a neck ultrasound is performed. On ultrasound, the nodule is described as a single, solid, and hypoechoic nodule measuring 1.8 by 1.2 by 0.9 centimeters with lobulated margins and the presence of microcalcifications. Consequently, the patient underwent FNA biopsy, which was reported as atypia of unknown significance, or Bethesda 3. And the question is, based on the above characteristics and the cytopathology results, what is the estimated risk of malignancy of this patient's thyroid nodule? And yet there are a couple of choices at the bottom for, the, for people to select. All right, okay. so um, let me go back into, oops, terrific. All right, so um, we can discuss that a little bit later if we have uh, time in the discussion portion. Uh, I'll just say up front, I have no financial disclosures that are relevant to this presentation. So I think I probably don't need to ex um, explain to this group the, the reason that we evaluate nodules in the thyroid. Um, these are just two examples from patients that we've seen um, recently, but you know, the. The point of thyroid nodule evaluation, obviously, is to detect thyroid cancers, particularly those that are clinically significant, um, and guide optimal management of those nodules and or cancers. Now, I'm sure that many of you are familiar with this guideline. This is the uh, American Thyroid Association guideline for adult thyroid nodules and thyroid cancer published early in 2016. Um, and this is a really extensive uh, guideline building on previous versions about the evaluation of thyroid nodules, not to mention the whole cancer management part. And the reason I mention this is this is just one figure from that uh, guideline, which is, you know, has a quite detailed flow diagram for the evaluation of thyroid nodules with lots of arrows broken out. And we're going to focus today on this part down here about uh, thyroid nodule cytology and based on the result of the cytology, various recommended management strategies. 
And I, I put this up just to point out that each of these arrows in the adult guideline is undergirded by quite a bit of data from the adult literature um, supporting what the what the recommended guidelines are. And clearly there are, there are still some debates, but there's a lot of data underlying all of this um, on the adult side. Um, and a, a good part of this, and the part where we're going to focus today, is the Bethesda system, which I'm sure everyone's aware of, um, published in 2009 and then updated in 2017, which was an effort to formalize and standardize um, the interpretation of cytology into these six categories from non-diagnostic and benign through malignant, each of which is associated with a recommended uh, risk of malignancy. And I'm going to just hide this left column. So the difference in the two columns is based on the treatment of this entity called NIFTP. Um, for the moment, we're not going to get into that debate today. We're just going to treat NIFP as a malignancy, which is what we did in this paper. But this is the recommended malignancy rate in each category for, for a given cytopathology lab, and based on that risk of malignancy, a recommended usual management strategy. And so this is what's used in adults. This was derived in adults based on large studies in adults. Um, and so the whole premise of our, of our research in this particular instance was um, how this applies to children. And just for a bit of historical a sort of perspective, you know, the evaluation of thyroid nodules and cancers in children, I think, has really lagged behind that in adults significantly. If you look in some of the very old literature, you can find malignancy rates in pediatric thyroid nodules in some of the old surgical series up to 60 or 70 percent. And that sort of led to this concept that thyroid nodules in kids are probably cancer and they should just be resected. Um, and in many cases, uh, many years ago, this was done even without what we would consider uh, an adequate valuation. valuation. These are These data, are data from, from our own institution, institution looking, looking back, back you know, now, now 50 years, years at, at the kinds of evaluations that kids had, had before thyroid surgery. surgery. And you, you can see in the, in the 80s, 80s and 90s, 90s almost, almost nobody, nobody had, had FNA. FNA. Many of them didn't, didn't have imaging, imaging um, um, except, except for sigraphy. Um, and it's only in the last, last you know, 10 to 15, in our institution, more like 20 years. But you know, across the board, 10 to 15 years that we've really Started, started to formalize, formalize the evaluation, evaluation of those, those nodules, nodules kids, kids in the way, in the way that, that it had been in adults, adults for a long time. And a lot of this was driven by this guideline, um, again, also published in 2015, for the guide management of children with thyroid nodules, of which Andy was a, was a major driver, and I'm glad he's here to share his thoughts with us. Um, and so this was an effort to really try to begin to standardize pediatric management, and the guideline was pretty explicit and self-conscious about the fact that at the time there were not a lot of pediatric data to go on, and so much of the recommendations were extrapolated from adult data, um, and part of the motivation of this was to stimulate the generation of pediatric data uh, to which we're trying to contribute. Um, the reason this matters is, as we're fond of saying in pediatrics, children are not small adults, right? Their physiology and biology is different in many respects, and these are just a couple of ways that uh, pediatric and thyroid neoplasia is different in kids and adults. I won't belabor these points, but obviously thyroid nodules are much less common in kids than they are in adults, who maybe the majority of people have nodules by older age. Malignancy rate in pediatric nodules is pretty clear now is higher than in adults, somewhere in the 20 to 25 percent range uh, in children. The genetic drivers are different. Um, it's not so much the BRAF and RAS mutations that are prevalent in adult thyroid cancers, much more fusions, and there's a significant part that we still don't really know in kids. Um, and also, as we think about how we manage uh, cytology results, uh, we have to think about what are our management options and do the risks differ? And we know that uh, risks of thyroid surgery, for example, are higher in children than in adults, particularly in centers that are not high surgical volume. So all of these things weigh into uh, this discussion about how do we apply adult data to the management of pediatric thyroid nodules and thyroid cancers. And so this is the evaluation scheme that was proposed in the first version of the pediatric guidelines, and it has a similar sort of structure. It really sort of centers on this FNA uh, biopsy of a thyroid nodule, and then again, based on the result, uh, a recommended management strategy. And essentially, if this, in this particular version, the um, any abnormality, cytologic abnormality, um, the recommendation was to resect, um, and we'll, we can go into that. But our focus was really on the you know, the data, or you know, sort of trying to clarify the data underlying these recommendations. What is the malignancy rate in these various cytological categories in pediatric nodules? Are they the same or different to adult adults? adults? 
These are some These are of the some pre of the pre-existing, pre-existing data. data. Um, and this, is and a, this is a summary, summary table, table put together by our, by our colleague, colleague John Wasserman, Wasserman in Toronto. Toronto. Um, and, um, and you can see there are a number of studies, studies, studies that essentially, essentially all of these all are these retrospective. So once, once Bethesda, Bethesda was, was promulgated, it's sort of going, going back and re reading the pediatric FNA cytology um, in various, um, various institutions, institutions. Some, some using, using Bethesda, Bethesda some, some using various, various versions, versions of not, not exactly, exactly Bethesda. Bethesda. Um, um, in general, in general the, numbers the numbers are sort of, sort of medium, medium uh, to small, small uh, which, uh, which is typical, typical in pediatric thyroid, thyroid because, it's, because it's, it's a rare, it's a rare disease. disease. Um, um, but, but overall, overall what, you, what you can see here, see here is that in these, in these indeterminate, indeterminate categories, categories Bethesda threes and reasons and fours, the rate of malignancy is here about 50%, significantly higher than what would have been suggested by Bethesda. Adults. Adults. Um, um, worth, worth pointing, pointing out, pointing out that, that this is in resected, resected nodules, nodules, nodules only, only, so there's, so there's going to be bias toward, toward resected nodules, nodules, nodules that are, that are likely, likely to be malignant. malignant. Um, um, and there are, there are other, other things, things that, that sort of sort of little, little variation studies, studies. A lot of them include patients, patients up to 21, 21 years old, old, which we would sort of not classically think, think of as, as pediatric patients. patients. Um, again, again, retrospective, retrospective sort of rereading reading of, uh, of cytology. cytology. And I think, and I think the big question, question is, is you know, we, know, we know even in, even in experience in cytology hands, 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 the cytopathology in these determinate categories can be quite variable. In patients, they're not always consistent, even even between between or even within a single cytopathologist. So so you know without Without being able, being to, able directly to directly compare, compare these numbers, these numbers to, to site of site of adult site of cytology that read, read in the same, same way, way, it's hard, it's hard to, know to know whether these differences, differences are really true or whether, or whether they're, they're just a matter of logical, logical interpretation. interpretation. And that was and that, really the premise for this study. Um, and we wanted to really look in a, in a controlled way, comparing cytology in, between children and adults pediatric and adult nodules that have been read the same way. And we're in a, in a good position to do that because of the structure of our thyroid center in which our pediatric thyroid nodule patients are evaluated. Um, we actually physically see them at our sister adult hospital, Brigham and Women's, um, and that's where all of their cytology is read um, in the, by the same cytopathology group that reads all of the adult cytopathology. And that group is led by Ed Sebus, who, as I may have mentioned, is, is one of the architects of the Bethesda system. So we've been reading by Bethesda for well before Bethesda was actually official um, in play, um, and that allowed us to look back and ask the following question, which is, what are the malignancy rates in thyroid nodules within these different Bethesda cytopathology categories evaluated by consistent cytopathology across both children and adults? And that was the, the essential question. And before I say any more, I just want to give a shout out to Christine Chirella, who was the lead author on this um, work as, as a fellow, did a fantastic job with this and many other things. She's now um, one of our uh, attendings in the Thyroid Center at uh, Boston Children's. So this is the structure of the study. Um, we looked at uh, cytopathology from all FNAs. This is all consecutive FNAs on nodules over a centimeter done over about 19 years um, across the age range from uh, pediatric through adult. Um, all the cytology was read prospectively, meaning in the course of clinical care. So this was just read as they came in for clinical care by the same cytopathology group evaluating all patients. Uh, and they read according to Bethesda criteria throughout this period. Um, the management of the nodules, I'm not going to go into in detail, but it was essentially in keeping with um, the, both the adult and pediatric guidelines. That is, for benign nodules, observation, for malignant nodules, resection, and for indeterminate nodules, um, depending on the degree, degree excuse me, either uh, repeat FNA and then resection if, if abnormality remained, or in adults, sometimes observation. We did not use molecular testing in children. Um, there was some molecular testing that was done in some of the adult patients after that that validation study came out in 2012, um, and I'll mention the relevance of that later, but that was not a, a major part of the study. Um, we collected data on the patients, on the nodule characteristics uh, of the nodules that were biopsied, and most importantly, the cytopathology and histopathology of the nodules where that ladder was available. As I mentioned, we did consider NIFPs to be malignant, uh, mostly because NIFP wasn't really defined as a, as a category for the until the very end of the study period, um, and still somewhat vague in pediatrics. So for the purposes of this discussion, NIFP was considered a malignancy. Um, and this was the primary outcome, as I said, just the malignancy rates in each category of Bethesda, and we divided children, as, defined children as being under 19, and adults as being 19 or older. And the malignancy rates were calculated in two ways. Some may be familiar with this um, issue of, you know, how do you calculate malignancy rates um, using the denominator of all nodules, um, which assumes that any non-resected nodule is going to be benign, which is not necessarily true, um, or do you only use nodules with proven histopathology, in which case you're going to bias toward a higher malignancy rate because people 
tend to resect nodules that they feel for clinical reasons have a higher risk of malignancy. So the true malignancy rate is somewhere in between these two numbers, and which one it's closer to is going to probably depend on how high your resection rate is within a category. So we'll talk about that as we go. These are the patients and nodules that we studied. So you can see pediatric patients on the left, adult patients on the right, about 300 children, about 9,000 adults, translating to a little over 400 pediatric nodules and about 13,000 adult nodules. Um, similar distribution of sex, obviously the ages are different. Um, adults much more likely to have multiple nodules present, although that wasn't a particularly uh, relevant finding for this study. The distribution of sizes of the nodules were essentially identical uh, between kids and adults, but I will point out that in kids, the nodules were, there were more predominantly cystic nodules that were biopsied. Uh, that I think reflects a little bit more conservative approach in, that we've tended to have historically in kids, where if, if a nodule is big, we tend to biopsy it, even if it's predominantly cystic, um, maybe changing a bit, but um, I think that reflects practice and that will play out in a, in a way that I'll show you in a little bit. These are the results, and I'm not going to go through this table in this format because I realize it's too small to read easily, but just as sort of the setup of the results, this is cytology categories over here from non-diagnostic through malignant. There's a set of data about pediatric patients, total number of nodules, how many were resected, and malignancy rates, the same for adults, and then um, statistical comparisons of the malignancy rates in kids versus adults, and then uh, comparing that to the recommended implied risk from Bethesda. So I'm going to walk you through this in a structured way to sort of give, give you sort of how I would think about this. The first, I think, thing that we wanted to just see is what's the distribution of cytology results? You know, how many of each category are we getting and how do they um, differ or are similar between kids and adults? Um, so I think the relevant findings here were that we had fewer of the Bethesda 4s, the follicular neoplasm group, only 3% in kids as compared to 6% in adults. Um, we had a lot more non-diagnostic samples in kids, um, about twice the number, and that uh, I think is, there are two explanations, but pri primarily it goes back to that point that I made earlier. We tended to biopsy more cystic nodules in kids, um, and we were able to show in this study, and it's been shown in other places, that you know if you biopsy a, a predominantly cystic nodule, there's a higher likelihood of it being non-diagnostic. So that's the primary reason that there are more non-diagnostics in our pediatric cohort. Um, even among the solid nodules, um, there was a higher rate of non-diagnostics in kids, and I don't have an explanation for that, but it's primarily related to this practice of biopsying cystic nodules in kids. So that's kind of the distribution. Before getting into the malignancy rates in kids, I think one of the important pieces for us was to demonstrate that the cytological interpretations on the adult side were in line with the benchmark, which is Bethesda. So this is just comparing the data, the malignancy rates by cytological category in our adult cohort as compared to what's recommended by Bethesda. Um, and we felt pretty good that the malignancy rates that we found in our cohort pretty much lined up well with what's recommended by Bethesda, uh, particularly in these indeterminate categories. And I think that was an important validation to say that this adult cytopathology lab that we're using um, is reading according to Bethesda. Um, and obviously there's a range here, but this is sort of a, a benchmarking of the, of the cytopathology so that we can compare the pediatric patients to these adult patients and feel that we're approximating um, how they would be evaluated by a quote unquote true uh, Bethesda read. And then this is sort of the crux of the data, um, comparing the malignancy rates uh, in children versus adults by cytological category. Um, and I'll sort of highlight the things that I think are, are relevant. So in the more abnormal category, suspicious and malignant, there was really no difference uh, between kids and adults. Uh, in the benign category, there was a, a statistical difference just because of the large number of nodules there, but this I would consider a, a, the absolute numbers to be clinically insig insignificant, it's like 0.7 versus 1%. So I would argue this is probably not a significant difference. The real difference is here, as you can see in the indeterminate categories, as was suggested by some of the earlier studies, about a two-fold higher risk in the AUS group and about a two-and-a-half-fold higher risk in the, the follicular neoplasm group. Also point out this difference in the non-diagnostic group, which I may not have time to go into right now, and perhaps we can talk about later. Um, and this is among the group of all nodules, so uh, including all nodules, whether or not they had histopathology. These are the same data, just in tabular form. So 
the pediatric uh, malignancy rate and adult malignancy rate by category and showing the absolute numbers and significance. So uh, as I mentioned, right, there's a, there, there may be differences whether you look at the denominator of all nodules or only um, resected nodules. Um, so if you move, you look at resected nodules only, uh, some of these differences don't have statistical significance in this group, um, particularly this one, the AUS, which caught our attention. The follicular neoplasms did continue to. Um, and so the question is, you know, the, the truth is probably somewhere in between. And the answer, the question we were asking is, which is correct? Is there really a difference or is there really not a difference? I think it's important to point out that, as I said, when you resect, when you look at only resected nodules, you're going to have a bias toward higher malignancy rates. Um, and that bias is going to be proportional to how it really inversely proportional to your resection rate. So if you tend to resect not that many, um, then the ones that you resect are going to be more biased toward malignancy. And that bias is, is greater in adults. So we resected about 80% of the pediatric AUS nodules, but less than 60% of the adult AUS nodules. So this number is biased upward more than this number. And so we were trying to figure out a way to, to kind of get at this and figure out, is this difference really true or not? And that led us to a sensitivity analysis where we thought about using um, the uh, gene expression classifier result as a way of getting at, can we, have a group of nodules that we feel are truly benign or very likely to be benign, even though they weren't resected to sort of tease this out more. So um, we looked at, of the AUS nodules in adults that were uh, gene classifier benign, we considered those in the sensitivity analysis to be sort of proven benign nodules. Um, and that's based on the actual malignancy rate in our cohort of 0%. That goes up to about 5% if you look in the overall validation study for this particular gene expression classifier, the, the malignancy rate was up to 5%. Um, so if you consider the, these nodules to be somewhere between 0 and 5% malignant, um, but you consider them to be sort of essentially hist histopathologically proven, you can sort of revise this number and it remains statistically significant in the AUS category between kids and adults. So I think my conclusion from this is that I think the result is the, the truth is probably closer to this this difference than to this statistical non-difference just because of the bias in resection toward resection of pediatric nodules compared to adults. So I, I think our conclusion was that we think malignancy risk really is higher in pediatric AUS nodules. Um, and the question is why that it might be. Now, obviously, cytological interpretation was kind of the, the beginning premise of this and the thing that we really wanted to exclude. And I think that we were able to do that in as rigorous a way as we could um, by showing that we're evaluating them in the same way as adult nodules within the same uh, group. There is this concept of different types of atypia. So cytological atypia, changes in the actual cells, is more associated with malignancy risk than just changes in the architecture. And so could those different types of atypia be differently uh, present in kids versus adults. Um, we looked at that and found that that was not the case. Um, they were equally distributed between kids and adults. So that did not seem to be the explanation. Um, you might speculate that there are, you know, kids and adults have different types of tumors. Maybe there's a different distribution of the types of cancers that they have. Um, that also was not the case. I, I didn't include those data, but it happened at the end if people are interested. But the distribution of types of thyroid cancers was the same within this category. I think the hypothesis that I'm sort of most interested in, although I have no proof for it, is whether adults may have a higher prevalence of other types of benign conditions that may cause cytological atypia but be benign. And I think autoimmune thyroiditis is a, would be a prime uh, candidate for this. Um, so if adults have more autoimmunity, maybe that causes them to have more atypia that is not cancer and thereby reduces their risk of apparent malignancy in, the, in this category. That's a hypothesis. I'd be interested to, to look into this further, but that's so far just a speculation. Or it could be some other difference, but I put the word biological in here because I really think that this is likely to be something different about kids and adults, not an issue of interpretation um, to the extent that we can, we can exclude that. I'll just throw in one other small piece, uh, which I think is just kind of interesting about pediatric management, and that's the question of repeating FNAs for some of these indeterminate specimens. So as I mentioned, that the current guideline um, for pediatrics suggests resection for any uh, indeterminate cytology, um, including AUS, um, and there's an explicit comment that one need not consider repeat FNA because the baseline risk of malignancy is high enough. Um, and so that it seems like a, a, a rational um, conclusion, and although in adults, 
uh, repeat FNA is at least considered. We just wanted to look at how that how repeat FNA would affect our practice. So we routinely repeat uh, FNAs of uh, atypical cytology prior to resection, and we wanted to look at what the effect of that was. So this, what you can see here, is the final cytology diagnosis up among nodules that were initially atypical, and there were 29 of those that had repeats. So in our hands, um, eight of those repeats became benign on repeat, and those nodules we did not resect, and we've shown previously that this kind of nodule that goes from AUS to benign has a, a low malignancy rate um, and probably can be observed, whereas uh, a substantial proportion, almost 20%, were upgraded to a more significant abnormality that would either you know, suggest converting to a total thyroidectomy or at least considering a total thyroidectomy as opposed to a diagnostic lobectomy. So, you know, at least in our hands, a repeat a, uh, FNA for an AUS specimen in children actually did a, a affect or at least maybe influence management in nearly 50% of these atypical nodules. Um, and so, you know, given the the known risks of surgery in kids. I think this is something that's at least worth considering, particularly in kids in whom getting a, a, a repeat specimen is not that big a deal, an older adolescent uh, who doesn't need sedation. Um, this may be a helpful thing and may actually affect management in, in some cases. So I'm gonna skip over this just for time um, and just come to sort of a little summary so we have time for discussion. I think, you know, in our view, the, the, the advantages of this study are its size. So it's, you know, bigger than, as I showed you, sort of all of the previous studies put together um, in this particular area. There's, I, it's fair to say there's another large study that came out right around the same time um, with, fair to say, I think slightly different results, which I'd be happy to talk about. Um, but I think the main strength, as I, as I tried to, to elaborate, is um, really evaluating kids' cytopathology alongside adult cytopathology in a prospective way, um, according to Bethesda, to try to control for issues of interpretation. Um, however, obviously, you know, I think a, a major limitation, as, as in many of these studies, is the absolute numbers of these indeterminate pediatric nodules is still relatively small uh, because these are rare and they're a small percentage. Um, and so we have to be a little bit circumspect about exact percentages. You know, one cancer or two cancers one way or the other makes a big difference in those malignancy rates. So I think we have to be cautious about citing exact numbers here. There's always concern about referral bias. We are a, a large tertiary referral center. Um, however, we do we are also at the local center for a large uh, area of the country. So uh, and we we know that only a very small percentage of these patients were um, evaluated elsewhere before being sent sent in. So I think that's likely to be a small uh, bias, if any. Um, and it's fair to say that although the cytopathology was was read prospectively with the adults, the cytopathologist was not blinded to age. So they may have interpreted things differently in uh, a child than an adult. Um, unfortunately, that's a limitation of this, the design of the study and very difficult to get around in any study. Um, but that's, that's the, I think, a limitation here. So the conclusions that, that I would suggest from, from this is that uh, I think we really do think that malignancy risk is probably higher in pediatric um, AUS nodules and, and uh, SFN nodules compared to adults. The mechanism, I think, still remains unclear, but I think personally it's likely to be something biological that's truly different about kids um, rather than an issue of interpretation. Um, I, this is, again, a smaller point that repeat FNA in some of these uh, AUS nodules may, I think, alter management and may is at least worthy of consideration for kids um, as, as it suggested in adults. And then I threw this in at the end, which I didn't have time to go into just for time reasons, but the rate of malignancy in our nine diagnostic nodules was uh, not insignificant and higher than in adults, particularly those non-diagnostic nodules that were large or solid um, as opposed to cystic. Um, so I think that's just something to bear in mind. Again, I'm happy to speak to that more um, later if people are interested. So um, I know I spoke pretty quickly uh, just to try to get through some a bunch of stuff for time, but I'm going to stop there and pass things over to Andy. I'd love to hear his comments and, and thoughts and look forward to the discussion. Andy, I think you Andy. may be muted. Yeah, Andy, if you could unmute, please. Yep, got it. Thank you. Well, first, congratulations to Ari. Um, I always look forward to his articles because the way that his thyroid center is organized is really fabulous um, as far as having the adult input and the pediatric input working together. Uh, at CHOP, our cytologists are also Zubair, Balox, and Imigraf, the whole adult team. There are no cytopathologists at CHOP, so it also allows us to compare 
um, our results to ARI. So congratulations on a really nicely organized and um, presented article. Also thanks to Dr. Erkin and the Thank Foundation. Ariana in particular has been really fabulous helping to get this um, journal club up and running and moving forward. So I'm gonna kind of compliment to Ari's um, conclusions. And I think the two things that I will focus on, which will be kind of spread out over my um, kind of review is where we are for cytology and what the limits are as far as cytology. And I take a different spin a little bit more towards the molecular side. And in our first version of the ETA guidelines in 2015, we really kind of shied away from the molecular analysis of indeterminate cytology, which is, you know, a holy grail as far as trying to improve the positive predictive value, and negative predictive value within that category, because we didn't have a lot of data but within the land of pediatrics, I think we've left infancy. We're probably in early, early adolescence, maybe not completely mature. We still have some work to do to try to have some data that incorporates or supports the incorporation of molecular analysis. And at the end, you know, just to kind of jump to the end is we're still left with the decision, which Ari ended his presentation with, and whether repeat FNA is worthwhile or whether we should try to get more information from the data we have from the initial FNA. So I, um, those are my disclosures uh, and the things that I'll talk about, and I'm sure I, is the same. These are kind of our personal opinions, and we are working on version two of our guidelines. Um, so we'll see what the consensus is from that panel once we all get together and, and hopefully uh, submit that by next year. So in pediatrics, I think the nice thing is um, there is a recognition and uh, that there is a higher pretest probability for thyroid malignancy. I already went over that, so that should help improve uh, how we interpret our FNAs. Mm -hmm. And these things are obviously influenced by a number of um, different studies and different personal um, historical um, data for each patient. So I won't go through this, but there's been a number of studies that show a higher rate of malignancy in pediatric patients that present with nodules. And you can use the ultrasound and the FNA then to try to stratify what that risk is, either increasing the risk of malignancy from 25% up towards, you know, above 90, depending on the ultrasound and the FNA, and even down towards uh, less than 5% uh, based on those results as well. One of the earlier studies that Ari's group had published um, showed something similar. And again, looking at adult versus pediatric, this kind of same type of approach that he just presented for the FNA data um, and showing within his group, there's a 22 versus 14 percent. And the article he just presented, it was 19 versus 12 percent. So I don't think there's any argument that there is an increased risk of malignancy in, in a pediatric patient that presents with a thyroid nodule. The other risk factors at play um, into that as far as trying to alter or likely altering the pretest probability is the age of the patient and the sex of the patient, TSH levels, whether they're suppressed, which is associated with a lower risk of malignancy, and whether they're normal or mildly elevated, which we could argue does or does not increase the risk of malignancy. But then the more obvious ones, like a history of radiation exposure, most commonly from uh, a previous non-thyroid malignancy where radiation was used as part of the therapy, or our patients that have tumor predisposition syndromes. But the other things that alter that, of course, are the cytology. So which, uh, which um, nodules are biopsied is already, already alluded to, whether they're more cystic or not cystic, what the cytologic prep is, what the cytologic interpretation is. So there's many things that also alter the, the differences that we see in risk of malignancy um, when you look at the pediatric studies. So in our first version of the guidelines, we mentioned doing ultrasound to help select which patients should undergo FNA. I think we did a relatively limited job because we didn't say what FNA, what ultrasound characteristics should be used to help guide decisions on whether an FNA should be performed or not. The adults were ahead of us, and I think we're now kind of following suit, and we'll include this in the second version of our guidelines, where they, you know, the second, the 2016 version of the adult guidelines came up with this pictorial atlas of what nodule characteristics um, increase the likelihood of malignancy and also could then be used to help stratify which patients should undergo FNA. TIRADS is now becoming a, you know, a more commonly used and there's many versions of it in South Korea and Europe and the United States kind of have our own versions of TIRADS. And in general, I think it's an, something that we've probably all been doing, but it was actually put then into practice as far as a scoring system by looking at the five components of a nodule to decide what the likelihood of malignancy is uh, and the only difference which I'd like to point out in, in pediatrics is we really don't have any data to support using size as a, a criteria to select or not select patients for FNA, which I'll show you. 
And I think both in adults and pediatrics, this is a paper again from uh, Jonathan Wasserman's group at Sick Kids, um, and we have data to support this as well, that tyroids is helpful at the extremes. In nodules that are have low characteristics on tyroids, low scores on tyroids, or high scores on tyroids are pretty predictive of cytology and ultimately surgical pathology. But the ones in the middle are the ones in the middle. So indeterminate on ultrasound is indeterminate on ultrasound. It ends up being indeterminate on FNA often as well. The, of the five components, the composition is probably the most predictive as a single reliable feature. This is a paper that we published in 2018. There's another one that was published that actually showed you the data earlier from the Boston group that also supported using the percent cystic component of the nodule to help stratify what the likelihood of uh, risk is. And the, the, if it's more than 50% cystic, depending on what the solid portion looks like in lymph nodes, there's a lower risk of malignancy. Um, so that is a helpful stratification point uh, within the TIRAD system. Size should not be used uh, to stratify patients. And there's an, another paper I keep pointing to at Boston, which I you know, purposely selected for this review. Um, but they published a paper again this year looking at TIRADs in pediatrics and suggested that 17 of 77 um, papillothyroid cancers may have been missed um, using TIRADs if you use the size criteria. And then I went through the data and just pulled out the patients that would have not, if you took size out of the picture, uh, that percentage drops. So really using size is not something that ha there's enough data in pediatrics, although the rest of the characteristics on ultrasound, I think, are, are pretty aligned with the adult data to help stratify patients for undergoing FNA. As far as FNA, as far as cytology, um, I already went through this. So this was the initial Bethesda classification. This is the second edition that came out in 2016, 2017, which again, if you include NIFTP as a, a malignant lesion, it, it alters the risk of malignancy across the indeterminate spectrum, as you can see there. And in pediatrics, we have the same issues as adults. Um, up to 35% of our patients have indeterminate cytology, even within across the board, and it doesn't matter the experience of the center. Um, there'll be some differences, but there, we have the same challenges in pediatrics as there is in adults, and we need to you know, increase the data, as, as we've already talked about, to um, have more reliable data to help determine what the best approach is for these patients. Within that category, benign follicular variant PTC and minimally invasive follicular thyroid cancer, which is the most common form of FTC in pediatrics, which is still less than 5% of our patients, are ultimately the most common diagnosis, with benign obviously being more common than the other two, uh, more in category three, a little bit less in category four. So the, the data that if you look at across um, the, what Ari just presented for his group and comparing it to the 2016, the second edition of the Bethesda criteria, you can see the differences there. But the challenge we have in pediatrics, which Ari showed a table and I'll, I'll just reemphasize, is that there's vast differences in risk of malignancy across multiple studies. And so it's really difficult to know what these in the indeterminate categories, how to best interpret this. We could average it, but it's really skewing the data if you average you know, limited data and try to put it together and come up with a conclusion that would be clinically accurate um, certainly has its limitations. So the, the numbers for how many patients had a biopsy, how many had histologic confirmation, which obviously skews it more towards a higher risk of malignancy, um, and the variation across the cytologic interpretation is too vast, I think, to take this data in mass. Um, and we need to do a better job of one defining, maybe there are differences as Ari suggested of what the cytology looks like in pediatrics. Maybe there needs to be a pediatric Bethesda um, or at least coming up with an atlas to help increase the uniformity of interpretation. We try to combine just looking at if you take indeterminate ultrasound and indeterminate cytology and there really does, that doesn't help. It still ends up being that indeterminate, as I suggested, is indeterminate and that's the paper we're submitting. But if within those categories of the Bethesda category three, category four, and you look at the TIRAD scores, there's really no difference between the two. So ultrasound doesn't help skew whether a biopsy ends up being a higher or lower risk of malignancy. Um, if you look at the TIRADs characteristics of the nodule and try to compare it to the um, cytologic data. So we need to improve the selection of patients for FNA. I already alluded to, you know, the more cystic, the lower the likelihood of getting an adequate sample is. Um, and so there, I think there's enough data to help support that. And maybe we can um, back off on how many cystic lesions that we do an FNA on. But we also, what's really important, I think, for the practitioner is knowing what your institute-specific risk of malignancy is within each Bethesda category 
And then, as I mentioned, improving the accuracy and reliability across institutes. So the question is how to do that. Um, and I think there are limitations inherent to cytology. Uh, and that's why I think adults have been moving towards more ancillary testing with molecular landscape rather than just uh, relying on cytology. The ATA guidelines from 2015 for pediatrics uh, recognize that there's this indeterminate, but we didn't, as I said, support, there wasn't enough data to support molecular biology as far as testing. So lobectomy, diagnostic lobectomy was the most common recommendation as I already showed you in that flow diagram to help determine if a category three or four what the ultimate uh, diagnosis was. But in adults, as you are well aware of, there's increasing use of some of these assays. So things to increase the positive predictive value of an indeterminate uh, biopsy and things that help to improve the negative predictive value. Within pediatrics, really the only data that we have at this point um, would help, would, would support using the molecular profiles as far as oncogenic driver mutations. There really is no data to look at gene expression classifiers, gene sequencing classifiers, and very limited data within microRNA. We published a paper uh, just this year suggesting, it needs obviously further um, analysis, that patients that do not have an identifiable oncogene um, but are ultimately found to have a malignancy that the inclusion of the microRNA panels may actually help um, further identify cytology that's indeterminate that ultimately um, is a, a malignant lesion based on surgical pathology. So I think there's more data to follow um, for using microRNA data even within pediatrics. So these are the, just the verbiage from the ATA guidelines that we don't have enough data, but um, we can't suggest routinely using, using it. it. But since, since that, that time, time um, and this and is now, now the studies that came out, out, and there's been a number, a number of other studies, studies since that time, there's, there's a more recent, recent updated, updated uh, summary, summary of, of the uh, oncogenic uh, driver mutation data, data that in pediatrics by Vera Vera Paulson from Seattle Children's, Children's uh, in genes 2019. But there's, there's increasing data, data, and it's not prospective data, data in cytology. It's, 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 it's data, data that's obtained on surgical, surgical path to molecular analysis. analysis. But we, but do, we have do have a better, better understanding, understanding of the drivers, drivers um, that are involved in pediatric thyroid cancer. So the questions really are, does the presence of an oncogenic driver increase the negative predictive value and positive predictive value of indeterminate cytology? You had a nice talk, I think, from Yuri Nikiforov and Zubair Balak last week that I, I would hope everyone agreed showed that there is a support. Of course, it's not perfect. There are patients that will have a driver that ends up having a benign lesion. Um, and so, but it's it still provides uh, increased uh, accuracy towards diagnosis. And here's just a number of um, studies that you could pull from the literature to help support the rule-in test, the rule-out test. This multi-platform analysis is using Thygenx and Thyromere uh, in adults. It's just recently published, and then some review articles um, looking at the data within adults using uh, molecular profiling. So positive predictive value does seem to correlate with um, the presence of copy number alterations and the presence of oncogenic drivers. RAS was the exception. So if RAS is present, um, it may increase actually the benign call rate because it's more common to be in it, less invasive lesions and oftentimes in benign lesions as well. In pediatrics, we have no prospective studies. Um, we published in 2018 and there's very little data on oncogenic drivers and benign lesions. Um, if you look at from our paper from 2018, looking at adults and pediatrics with follicular adenomas, we had about 68 benign lesions that we um, subjected to the surgeon, the older surgeon panel um, before the Thygenics panel. And there was one patient that had a Pax AP per gamma uh, fusion within that benign lesion. That's how it ended up being 100%. It was just looking at what the percentages of the drivers, but 67 of 68 um, of the benign lesions did not have an identifiable driver mutation. The only limit was that there's no NTRAC fusion analysis within this panel at the time. So I think in pediatrics, we have data to support that the, the presence of an oncogenic driver help increases the positive predictive value. We need to do that in a prospective fashion, but, um, and there are certain genes that have a high likelihood of being correlating with papillary thyroid cancer, BRAF, RET fusions, NTRAC fusions, ALK fusions. We still have indeterminate oncogenes as well, though, RAS, P10, Dicer, um, all those drivers can be associated with both um, benign lesions as well as um, malignant lesions. So there are indeterminate oncogenes, just like there's indeterminate FNAs and indeterminate ultrasound features. And there really is no data yet to support a rule out test. There's no data showing improved negative predictive value, either using um, 
the thyroid seek or using Thygenx. Um, that is something that needs and would be a benefit to us clinically, but is not available as of now. So the other last part is, is there a genotype histologic correlation? And then is there a genotype invasive correlation? And I think we have data, again, to support that. So this is looking at classic PTC, follicular variant PTC, and follicular thyroid cancer. And you can see the differences between oncogenes between adults and pediatrics. And there are data to show that there are some of these indeterminate oncogenes that are more favorably associated uh, with less invasive lesions and BRAF infusions are more typically associated with classic PTC and also with diffuse sclerosing variant PTC. The follicular variant PTC, again, is another part that affects pediatrics as much as adults as far as is it encapsulated, non-encapsulated, invasive, non-invasive, and, but fortunately we don't have very many alkacytic lesions in pediatrics. Um, but within the follicular variant PTC, we just recently looked at can oncogenes help further identify if one's going to be more invasive or less invasive? And I think we have preliminary data, which we're just getting ready to submit, that shows that that's true. So fusions within the um, follicular variant PTC are more commonly associated with widely invasive follicular variant PTC rather than encapsulated follicular variant PTC. And you can see the numbers need to be expanded, um, and hopefully we can do that through a consortium that Ari, myself, and a couple other institutes are now building uh, for the pediatric community. As far as invasiveness, um, as I mentioned, there are genes that are associated with less invasive, invasive disease, and there are oncogenic drivers that are associated with more invasive disease, uh, and I think we have data to help support that. And another paper that we're in the midst of preparing also goes to support that, kind of looking at the thyroid cancer genome atlas uh, separation between different types of oncogenic drivers. And the fusions in pediatrics are more commonly associated with lateral neck lymph node metastasis as well as distant metastasis, more so than BRAF, and very limited data on RAS and RAS-like, but even more so than RAS-like. So there really is data to show histologic correlation, early data. Um, and to help use the driver mutation to predict the likelihood of invasive disease. So, so within, within pediatrics, I think um, indeterminate FNAs, we do have now increasing data, as I said, maybe early, early adolescence as far as the quality of the data um, to help determine what the risk of malignancy is and maybe even to help drive what the right approach is as far as total thyroidectomy or lobectomy. Um, we need further prospective studies to really, to really confirm if that's true. Um, and so it comes back to the last question that Ari left us with is, what do we do with indeterminate FNAs? Is it better to repeat the FNA or should we add molecular testing? Um, and as he mentioned, they had um, 29, actually 39, had repeat FNAs. Eight of those 29, um, 21 of those 29s either had the same or higher category. Um, so how many of those could have achieved surgical remission just by doing lobectomy, even within those, even though they were a higher risk category? Um, and could molecular testing have helped stratify that subgroup um, that Ari mentioned that on repeat FNA um, had the higher category rather than the same category or lower uh, on the Bethesda criteria? So in wrapping this up, um, the cytology is a repeat FNA or add ancillary molecular analysis. I think some of its style some of it is um, each institute's preference, and unfortunately, some of it in pediatrics is can we get insurances to pay for uh, ancillary molecular analysis? And that is a struggle that all of us who routinely take care of kids are continuing to face every week, um, is trying to get the insurance companies to pay for uh, oncogenic driver analysis with indeterminate FNAs. Um, so hopefully with increasing data, we can get increasing support for reimbursement. So with that, I will leave this and open this up to questions. Um, I think the next slide is just one more time to, to go through the poll question. So I'll leave this up here and see if our review of the topic altered your decision. Um, and then thank everyone for your time. Terrific presentation, both Ari and Andy. I really want to thank you on behalf of our participants. While we're waiting for the poll to just finish up here, it does look, I believe, like there was further um, that, uh, clarity here in the responses compared to what we had at the beginning, which is great. We always like to see that we're having some influence on um, people's understanding. Um, let me, we have a number of questions, but I just wanted to start off 
the, um, the questions with asking about this 19-year-old cutoff um, and whether or not you believe this is there's a biologic basis for this or whether or not this is really reflective of um, an in institutional uh, characterization or, or um, determination of um, what age group is uh, permitted to come in into your respective institutions. So, all right, should I take a crack at it? Yeah, I was say, go ahead, Andy, because it's, it's your part of the decision. <laughs> so when, when we were putting together the first version of the ATA guidelines that were published in 2015, this first question was an obstacle um, because the data was so varied. When the title said pediatric, the age range could have gone up to 21. It could have been less than 19. So we were trying to increase the consistency of the data, and we looked at what the WHO, the World Health Organization, had defined as pediatrics, and then as endocrinologists, what we thought was reasonable if there was any biologic explanation for why we might be seeing differences between um, the risk of malignancy and the behavior of the disease within pediatrics. And so we picked less than 19 based on those two factors, that most patients have achieved final height, um, are achieving at least near final weight and kind of final young adult physiology. And if that had any impact on the differences that we're observing clinically and the behavior and the risk of the disease, then that would help kind of more provide a more unified um, approach as far as reporting the data and interpreting the data. In practice, I think all of us end up having patients, you know, in, in Pediatrics at CHOP at Endocrine will take new patients up to age 21, so it hasn't limited us at CHOP, but other institutes and in other countries actually are limited based on age. We try not to see new 21-year-olds, but you know, our patients don't want to leave, um, and Ari probably has the same experience. Uh, are you limited, Ari, as far as you know, we clinical have the same, evaluation? We, do. we see new patients up to 21, but if they're you know, 20 and a half, we say, you know, do you really want to start your care here, or do you want to work with an adult doctor? Right. So what it's, you know, we had to come up with a cut point and you'd be surprised how many pediatricians does it take to decide what a pediatric patient is, but it's not as easy as it sounds. Yeah, uh, we've got a number of adult patients who we think might be better served in a pediatric uh, institution, but that's, uh, that's, that's a, a different discussion. Um, so I guess what would be really interesting, Ari, and I don't know if um, the numbers would allow you to do that, but obviously if you were to do um, a, a subgroup analysis here of looking at different age groups or within the, the zero to 19, whether there is a, um, a, a cohort within that that behaves more like the adult population and your numbers would reflect that and whether you know that would add some clarity as to what the appropriate age would be. Do you have any thoughts about that? Yeah, I mean, I think I think you're right. I'll just sort of share my personal view. I I personally don't think that there's a, a biological cutoff at 19, as Andy said. There's a, other factors, right? You know, is it 16 or 15 or is it puberty? I don't think we really know. Um, but there has we had to you know there has to be some demarcation if you want consistency in the literature. Um, I think, as you said, I, I suspect we did not try to do a subgroup analysis. I think the, the numbers become quite small, um, especially as you get into the very young ages. Um, in you know, if you look at young ages and indeterminate cytology, and you know, there's you get very little small numbers. So we didn't, I didn't feel like that was a statistically a, a thing that we could really do. It is an interesting question, though, and I think remains a somewhat of an open question. More generally, you know, is the risk of malignancy actually higher? at younger ages if so what is that age is it pre-puberty is it not and or is the behavior of tumors different there's you know some evidence that younger kids are more likely to have distant metastasis or at least more of the distant metastasis occurs in younger kids so uh, you know there there may well be some biological differences between very young kids whatever that means between you know before puberty perhaps and older adolescents um, but where what exactly that biology is and where the cutoff is i don't think we really know yet yeah, I think that probably that holds true from a surgical perspective in terms of degree of difficulty. What at what age does um, surgery um, below below that age become more challenging? And I, I suspect it uh, varies from child to child. Um, we've got a number of questions related to how you actually perform um, FNA ultrasound guided FNAs in your institutions, whether these are done under local, whether they're done under general anesthesia, and I suspect that probably weighs on the decision to perform a repeat aspirate. And so maybe Absolutely. if both of you 
on that. Sure. So, I mean, I'll, I'm happy to share what, what we do. So we do our uh, FNAs. We do not sedate patients almost ever, um, you know, except for the very young kids. Um, but we do them in the in the adult ultrasound suite. We do it under local. Um, we usually use uh, EMLA ahead of time. So we put a little EMLA on their neck, uh, which is placed by the nurse a little bit in advance. And then if they need a buy, we do that to everyone. Um, and uh, even on an initial visit. And if we find they need an FNA, we then place a little bit of local um, lidocaine and do it that way. Um, and we found that, you know, nearly everyone is tolerates that pretty well. You know, there are occasions where kids have either significant developmental delay or they're very young. Um, and those kids we will plan to sedate. Um, but but that's a very small percentage. Uh, they, they do pretty well. So um, that's kind of our practice. I don't know how what, what your practice is, Andy. Right. So, you know, I think the choices are conscious sedation or local with distraction, and I think it varies across institutes. We've been um, using conscious sedation and interventional radiology, which increases the cost and a little bit, you know, more cumbersome. Older adolescents are offered if they want conscious sedation or not, so it's not like everyone comes in and gets a ketamine IM injection as they walk through the door. Um, but I, the, the couple things I think that's helped improve, we've had very, very rare, I can't think the last time we had an unsatisfactory sample. So whether that's because of constellation or not, I think that would have to be studied across multiple institutes. But, and I'm sure Ari has the same. We have uh, the cytopath tech in the room with, uh, you know, confirmation of, di of adequacy of sample with a microscope there, and our microscope's actually now connected, video connected to the cytologist, so we can get preliminary reads as far as adequacy. And if they do one pass and it's adequate, they won't subject the patient to two or three passes. Um, but it also allows us to get an initial indeterminate read, and we can do an extra pass for molecular analysis if we can get insurance to approve it. So the conscious sedation, I think, has worked really nicely at, at CHOP. Um, it allows us to biopsy whoever we need to biopsy without the patient squirming and, and having a terrible experience through the procedure, or even if it's the, you know, the, a nodule you can get away with. When you start doing lymph nodes, I think it gets a little bit more cumbersome and a little bit more painful for the patient. Um, but it's a matter of styling it in each institute. Ari has good data of doing local and um, not conscious sedation, and I know in our institute we do it a little differently. The cost is definitely higher for conscious sedation in IR, that I can tell you. Great. Um, one of our uh, participants asked the question of what the incidence of children um, in area study that did have predisposition uh, syndromes, and um, how does the management change when you identify those particular uh, individuals? Yeah, that's a great question. So uh, in, in this study, in the pediatric group, it was about about 5% of them had known genetic predispositions. You know, some of them may have had genetic conditions that were not diagnosed, but it was about 5% who were known. Um, and I think, you know, our, our approach has been, obviously, those kids are higher risk. Um, in terms of the sort of um, immediate management, you know, we manage those nodules as we would other nodules. That is, you know, we depending on the ultrasound features, uh, make a decision about and you know whether to biopsy them or not. Um, and then you know we, we manage the cytology similar to what we would in other patients. I think the difference is that oftentimes those patients have multiple nodules. Um, and so then it becomes a discussion. You know, I think the management decisions are sometimes a little bit different. Certainly if we have an indeterminate uh, cytology in a patient like that, I'm going to be a little bit more cautious about, you know, observing that. I'm I'm probably going to be a little bit more likely to to go to resection if I don't know, uh, if I'm not unsure. Um, and then those decisions become a little more complicated if they have multiple nodules or a nodule on the other side. And what surgery do you do? And that's a discussion with the family and kind of seeing how how they feel. Um, but I would say on a per nodule basis, I don't. I think my management is not particularly different. But the overall things do change a little bit because of the underlying risk. Right. So, um, Andy, I, I want to take advantage of one um, one of our participants from Alabama um, uh, has asked the question, which I think will be a self-fulfilling prophecy of how to join your consortium. Uh, so let, maybe if you want to put in a plug for that. Sure. So um, we've been working on this for about a year and we're finally in launch mode. So Boston, Ari's group, Sick Kids, Yale, MD Anderson and CHOP are organized and now we're finally in the DocuSign stage of this collegial uh, organization. So, and I just received a large grant from CHOP to expand this um, to not only have our kind of core group, but also expand it then to other 
institutes and, and actually include a biorepository as well with hopefully some molecular analysis of samples that are sent to us to not just have um, data just from CHOP, but to, to have a better understanding of the landscape across institutes. So hopefully next year we're going to start um, inviting other institutes to join us and we've gone back and forth like do you have to have a certain volume to, to qualify to be in the consortium I think the group and, and Ari can you know also weigh in essentially said we want to make this as big of a community as possible and really the requirement is just that you have the support to be able to contribute so you have to be able to fill in the clinical registry which we're working on a uniform registry it'll be web-based um, and and so hopefully in 2021 it becomes more available and they should just contact me uh, offline and we'll keep a running list of people that are interested in, in joining and as we get the capacity to expand um, we'll start extending the invitation awesome well listen i, I want to first of all congratulations on that initiative it uh, certainly represents um hopefully a, a step in getting some answers to the questions that both of you have posed this morning so i um a, as we do every week i want to um make sure that we stop hard at uh, 9 a.m which we're up at the hour um i want to again thank both of you i want to thank all of our participants has been an outstanding educational experience this morning um i can speak for myself and saying that i learned a lot um so thank you and um everybody stay safe and i hope you'll join us next week